and welcome to another episode of the show, Must Go On. Our guest for today is Tracy Laramori. Let's get this show on the road. You are on the, how do I say, the office side of show business. Um, I always say there's three sides. There's on stage, backstage, and off stage. And so you're on the off stage, the office side. Um, how did you get into PR and publicity and marketing and all that? So it's a really interesting story. The traditional way to be in PR, one of two ways. People either decide on the outside, I want to be a publicist, and they go to you know the university route, and they go to school for four years, and they get their degree, and then they come an intern with someone like me. Or the other traditional way is usually you know, they come from media. So it's common also if you're in media, if you're a journalist, and then you, you know, you leave journalism, you maybe get a client and you know how to talk to media and how to pitch to media. So you become a publicist. Those are the two common ways, but mine was crazy different. And um, that's because I was, I was basically in my twenties. I was a uh, early you know, entry level sales and marketing. I probably just did a corporate track. I would have been lucky probably with my red hair and everything, you know, my natural red to, to be a middle manager or something. Um, but what I was doing in my part-time, or not part-time, in my non nine to five life, we had actually my husband and myself, Dave Parkinson, we had a full-time job and we had a part-time job to make things meet, ends meet in the early days, you know, to get a mortgage on a house in Toronto where things were expensive. So we were working, you know, like crazy. But when we came home from work, instead of playing, you know, video games or something, we were activists, you know. So we were making, we used to have a radio show. We didn't have it anymore. So we were basically making a web page that would have some issue, talk about, you know, issues around anti-racism and various kinds of abuse. And, you know, just, you know, the kind of stuff that we were doing on our radio show in our 20s as young activists. And in in the early days of the internet so we didn't have the radio show anymore we thought oh we'll just you know make a page which is with links to other people's stuff and that's it you know go about our lives but while we were doing that and we certainly weren't looking for anything to do with criminal justice or the death penalty that was not anything that we had ever thought about it wasn't in our even as activists that was not you know something we were conscious of and suddenly we found out about the case of a guy and it was not getting a lot of attention with literally this little corner of the internet where he had paid to, to be listed and it was a guy named jimmy dennis then on death row in philadelphia who was claiming that he was innocent actually innocent and um people have asked well what, what made you do this but for some reason we actually wrote a letter actual letter my husband and myself we sat down and wrote it and mailed it off and put a stamp on it and sent it to death row and I remember we were like how innocent can this guy be and I think the reason people said well why did you actually do that it had to be more than just being an activist because there's still that extra step I think because we'd had the radio show not long before that even though we didn't have it anymore we were still very much in that you know information gathering asking questions what's going on here and so that was our original oh that's interesting let's what's this about there's an address there you can write you know what let's do it you know, with that Uber's in the twenties. Well, he wrote back eighteen pages, written on both sides. We still have it somewhere with whatever court documentation he had in the cell at the time, which was the most recent, you know, appeal and what the prosecution had said and said what, what that that was. And essentially, we were like galvanized. Wow, this is crazy because it was enough. Even reading the documentation, huh? And later on, we ended up getting all the court transcripts, thanks to a couple from Illinois and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so by that time, we knew before the advocacy began. Anyway, long story short, can't help but be a long story, is through that work, ultimately, he was released in 2017. So we were involved with that from the age of 28 till the age of, we were all 47. We call each other brother and sister now, and he's, we talk all the time. He's now an R&B artist in Philadelphia because that's what he was doing when they stole him away from his life for 25 years. And he's in the process now of being in court waiting for, you know, money for that time. Like, you can pay that back. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so while that was going on, and that was a 20-year journey, and I, we had written press releases and media that got us international attention around the world that drew people into his campaign. But also we started speaking as 28 year olds with no legal education and no media history right this is where the story comes in about the publicist all of a sudden we're on not just about his case but about the death penalty in general we're on cnn msnbc court tv a and e they're doing an hour-long documentary on us cbc here the national you know uh, television so Meanwhile, we're just telemarketers. We're still in our day job. We're just telemarketers. My husband's in whatever entry level sales. But we're doing this kind of messaging where we're like being interviewed by 
Dan Abrams and Court to cry, Catherine Cryer and Nancy Grace, you know. But yet it took me 10 years. That was not for work. I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about the advocacy work we were doing. And suddenly there one day, a couple of years before Jimmy got out, but when things were really finally starting to turn our way, we were starting to slide at the end of that tunnel. But I'm sitting there doing my regular telesales one day, you know, and it just literally hit me. I was like, you know what? I don't want to do another 20 calls an hour for something I really don't care about. I, you know, hi, this is Tracy calling from something I really don't care about. And, you know, you don't care either. And this, I just hate my life. <laughs> Can't wait till I get home. And it just hit me that, and this is where people can take it as a, you know, this, everybody has something they either love or are passionate about, that they're good at, they have skills at, but they think that the nine to five, you have to hate. And you think that's something you have to get through to get to those other things. Not necessarily. So it suddenly hit me that I can, you know, all those writing skills, that uh, media, those media skills and understanding of reaching out to media, how to talk to media, how to all that stuff, I could maybe segue into, you know, business. And so I started doing it for, you know, just putting myself out as a freelancer at first and started with some, you know, entrepreneurs and small entertainment projects, local entertainers. Oh, let me do this for you, got good results. Ended up getting hired by Rosa Parks cousin Rosa Parks. I mean, like, here I am up in Canada. Like, you know, every year before that, I used to write, thank you, Sister Rosa, before I ever would have imagined a mythical character to me, you know, on her birthday, or I would write, thank you, Sister Rosa, on Facebook, because there's a song like that. And then all of a sudden, a meeting cousin and her cousin's hiring me for a film, My Life with Rosie, about Rosa Parks' next 30 years of advocacy when she, after Alabama, when she moved to Detroit. And, and then she, you know, so I'm, I'm thanked in the credits for that. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm really in the game. I'm getting paid for this. I'm this is big. So and then that built up my confidence. I ended up opening a general partnership. And then things just, you know, I'm strategic and smart. And every little thing that happens, I end up building on that and making something else happen. And, you know, all of a sudden in COVID, we scaled up at the end of COVID and incorporated. And so now all of a sudden, this crazy story, Jimmy Dennis gets out in 2017. He's now an R&B artist getting some attention. He's been played on a bunch of big name things and he, people are talking about signing him and it's actually serious, not just as a, you know, novelty act or something. And there, by the time he gets out, those people that were just entry level telemarketers or whatever are now literally award-winning publicists. So now I can say, he's my client, check him out on all streaming platforms instead of he's innocent and he has an execution date, please help. So when <laughs> that is that's how I started to write a press release and learn to be a publicist. Wow. That is an amazing story. I'm glad. It's sad that a lot of his years were wasted. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. But I'm glad he, he got out um, and he's free. I have the whole other day, but I mean, you won't see me smiling when I'm talking about that. We sit here and, you know, when he, he gets in and talks about that, it's a hugely, and if anyone's interested in that story, please Google Jimmy Dennis because there's articles and there's podcasts and interviews and radio shows and he talks deep about, you know, that's, that, I mean, it was, you know, when people say you can never give enough money to pay that back, like, honestly, I want to cry when I think about it, because I was with there since 1999 is when we met him, and we were all 20, or 98, we were all 28 years old, he was 27, and then when we get out, when he gets out, we're 47, and he's 46, and my biggest nightmare is, like, now we're 50, and I keep thinking, like, you know, I don't care how much money they give him, we're 50 years old now. Anybody could drop dead tomorrow, you know? And plus those little girls that he sent pictures of when they were six and nine years old when we first met. Well, by the time and that he thought he was going to get out when they were still children. By the time he got out, they literally have children the age of those they were in those pictures. So it's like, you can't, I don't care how many million you ultimately give them after arguing and fighting about it, but the, like the beast that they are because they still don't want to, give justice you know it's a, it's a whole it's, i'm telling you man it's not that's not a nice you know situation and that's what i what i built and to some people that's a controversial topic and if you were gonna say hey learn to be a publicist you certainly wouldn't tell people to go out and make their public name because if you you know years ago if you google my name that's all the stuff that would come up thousands of articles about that work you wouldn't say go make your public name on something so controversial, if you're going to then come back and represent other people in entertainment, but it hasn't at all impaired. In fact, you know, the people that have come to me really appreciate that work and like, you know, they know that I'm for real, I guess, you know, but that wasn't paid work. It never would be, it wouldn't take, you know, I just learned, it took me even a long time to even like years to even think, hey, I could take those skills and, you know, why not? Use them, yeah. Earlier. 
because then I would have had more platforms to and more money and all that to be successful to because look what we were able to do all those things you know without even two pennies to rub together as poor activists if we'd had money to buy these platforms and billboards and you know who knows what we could have done but whatever I think it was the good you know every I think it's a good everything has a good result so I'm not complaining in the end but yeah, that's only, you know, after years of struggle and thinking it might not go our way. So I, I can smile now thinking oh, we won, like, because he did get out and he's free now. And every time I talk to him from a cell, a cell, not a cell, you know, right, right. win every time. So, ah, but yeah, that's, you know, there's no really short answer. How did you get into PR? You know, if it's a hard business only podcast and that's all they want, I try to condense it. But even, you know, when you condense it, it's even straight, like you really have to give the background. Because I learned to write a press release about a guy on death row would be the short story, but then it's like, wait, what? Why? What? And you snap the right image, what you're saying. So, yeah, it's a hard, but you know, but the, the, the general part where everybody can take it is, you know, even if you're the crazy red hair girl or, you know, overweight or whatever, there's all these barriers to you in traditional business. It doesn't matter. Because, like, if you look at your life and you look at your confidence and your own skills and your whatever, there may be something that you can, you know, utilize to build actually a life that you love as well. Yes. Yes, I do believe most people that are successful don't get their knowledge or success from school, but they do get it from doing something, volunteering their time, doing something just because, and then they realize, wait a second, I've just built skills. I can now use this for myself. And so I think that's an amazing story. That's probably this, the story everyone I've talked to an entrepreneur has, that they had no intention of being an entrepreneur. It just happened. So on your, your road to becoming a PR, what are some things you learned? Because obviously you weren't trying to learn these things, but what are some of the things you learned about publicity that maybe you would not have known had you not actually gone doing this stuff? Um, well, just, I mean, just the real, you know, the actual, not even things you'd be surprised by, but just the literally learning the know-how, the, the learning how to write a press release. I remember literally going to Alta Vista the precursor of Google uh, about Jimmy Dennison. We were like, we just made this website. We're like, okay, so what do we do to get it to media? I've heard of press, okay, so Google or whatever, Alta Vista press release and starting, okay, for immediate release, there's three paragraphs, you know, a quote in there and all right. But still, so literally those kind of things. And then I don't know about so much, you know, then, cause there was a period of time, you know, between the really hard work of doing the media that we did for Jimmy, because then when, when lawyers got involved, you know, so at some point they're always like, oh, wait till this thing goes to court. Don't make noise right now. We don't want to annoy the judge. That's such always a thing that happens between lawyers and media always because lawyers really believe in the system. That's what they're trained for within the courtroom, right? They're not as, unless they're real showboats or they're really, unless they don't have a case, but if they have a case, they want to they present that case without really, you know, because the media can so, like Jimmy's still, you know, like the Philadelphia media, with you know, when people are being convicted, they're not looking properly to see if someone's innocent. They're usually just, you know. So anyway, I learned all kinds of stuff about that, about media, about that they don't always tell the right story, that you, you can't always assume they're going to know the story, you know, and that they're even going to necessarily be fair. Though in my professional work, they've always been fair. I, since I've been a publicist representing clients, I, I, I don't know if it's because I'm skilled with, you know, if I knowing where the things might be, if they're like, you're going to misunderstand something. And I'm not talking about spin because I don't do anything that I have to do spin for. We're still really heart centered. And that's why we deal with creatives and small businesses where there's like a person, an individual who's not going to change on a dime. You know, it's not going to be like a politician where we might sit down and I might be all on board with everything they say today. <laughs> and we write a contract in the book oh and then all of a sudden tomorrow they're oh that's i can't get behind that you know so i don't like that i want to always be you know love the messaging so what i really learned you know is like yeah you've got to um media always gets something wrong it's usually something small and you can't get upset about people will be like oh look they, they said i worked there for 10 years but i only worked there for i would actually worked there for 15 years it doesn't matter it's a little thing it's not like a material to the story it's not or that, that might be in some case, but you know, so they always get something wrong. You don't get upset about those things. You don't, you know, um, 
and that you can get you have the power of the media really and how you anybody because we didn't have we weren't a PR company we just learned how to write that messaging so I still say like sure hire a publicist but if you you don't if you can't and if you're good at words and you understand what we say if we're talking to an entrepreneurial audience if you understand the difference when we say when you're reaching out to a newsroom it has to be editorial versus advertorial that's huge because I mean that's literally the beginning when people say well what should I think of first steps from an entrepreneur and I want to reach out to media what would I, the first thing I do and I said the first thing is don't reach out to media I'm not saying never I'm just saying hold up wait a second because chances are what you're thinking of sending them 90% of entrepreneurs have in our mind that advertorial and that that's again what like you might this my product is the best product it's the best lemon juice ever or like, you know what I mean? As opposed to, you know, editorial, which is what, like, so you're thinking of, you have to get away from thinking, which we all know. And the editor knows you're thinking, which is yay, free advertising for my, you know, my story in the media. They all know how valuable that, that, you know, little space is. And so you have to really be thinking about editorial, meaning give good content, you know, so what's, what does this audience, what is, what are they presenting? Who is their audience? What, what am I gifting? Am I gifting them with something? And then if you're doing that, you're really thinking, what are the kind of stories they tell? And that's a really hard, hard barrier, especially when it comes to business stories. It doesn't matter how great your new business is or, you know, how awesome your product is. That's anytime it's a business talking about the business, nine times out of 10, it's advertorial. It's a really high bar not to be you know, you may have something that's newsworthy, but again, to convince the editor where that has that little limited space or that 22 minutes on the news, it's probably not actually as newsworthy as you think it is. And a good exercise is to think, where would I, you know, to actually think, really edit yourself. Where would I expect to see a story like this? Would I see that in the 20 second news normally, in 22 minute news, not so much. Would I maybe see it, maybe not in the first five pages of the newspaper, but maybe on page A15 or A16 or in the lifestyle section. That'll tell you where to pitch it and who to pitch it to. Instead of pitching it to, you know, the business news, maybe pitch it to the lifestyle person or the, you know, so that it's, and think about, um topical press releases which is say there's something going on in the news which you know is going to have is going to be mentioned again in the news so not a one-off but something that's going to talk again in some many cases they'll want additional voices because it's an ongoing story so how do they keep that ongoing story going so for things like covid or black lives matter you know when george floyd first happened they need to keep on going but but do you have a, a different perspective so if you have a different perspective because you're a preacher and you've been noticing your congregation has been saying this or whatever or you're a music producer and you've made a song about you know so it's not and not about jumping on bandwagons never so that can be a you have to watch out for that too but in terms of if you actually have something that from what either it's your job or whatever experience the book you wrote or whatever where you would normally you see something on tv and you turn to your friend oh you know what i think about that so you actually have a perspective on it but they may not have heard that's called a topical press release so you would say you know casey who speaks to entrepreneurs it's like you've you've seen a story about you know what entrepreneurs are, are scared during covid of and then you pitch and you say hey you know what my name's casey and i speak to entrepreneurs across america on the daily Every day I speak to entrepreneurs across industries and I ask them all kinds of questions. And what I know I find out is, you know, they're actually confident about this and blah, blah, blah. Then they, you pitch that to them, they may come and interview you. You know, see what I mean? So that's topical press release. So that's the way you have to think about giving them angles, editorial things, not, you know, please put me in and mention my cool company. Right. So people in show business, um, how when choosing first of all the first question is how can a publicist help them especially nowadays where there's more independent artists as opposed to people you know signing up with an agency there more people are becoming independent so how could they use a publicist and how could it help them yeah i work with indie artists all the time so having a publicist certainly doesn't make you not indie it's like having you know a partner and a strategist and a person helping you in terms of you know, building your brand. I'm really careful about the, I work with 
Uh, I have like 39 clients in terms of music where I have one, two, three, four, six, seven right now, because I am seriously, you know, my guys are stars or they have the ability, I mean, they have the ability to be stars. I'm perfectly confident putting them on every stage, you know, and so there's something special with all of them. I believe in everybody, like all my clients, I believe in every single, everybody that I take on. Anyway, so yeah, an indie artist. So basically, you know, number one, it's your little business, number one, as, as well as being, you know, an artist on the stage. And you are ultimately, mostly what you want to be doing is performing. That's what you love. You don't want to be reinventing the wheel in the back office for six hours a day, you know, or even two, three hours a day researching, because half of that time, you know, you'd be just researching to figure out the stuff that we already know, or we already have, and we already have these relationships that, like when an artist signs on with me, I believe in them enough to take them on, you know, and back them, put them my name behind them and everything. I have industry relationships, you know, where I know right off the top, I can get you profiled in this, you know, magazine series about Meet the Rising Stars because, and that's not pay to play. You can't pay to get in there. It's not advertising. But the relationship that I have with the editors where I've sent them so many good ones, but they, oh, they get an email from me, they go, oh, okay, they open it up. They consider 99% of the time. It's, it, it, you know, that's why I know how to frame it. Like I'm like the frame, you, my, the creative artist is the picture. And we're the frame that helps present it. You know, we're the frame that puts it on the wall that makes it like, hey, did you see this? Did you... Elevating and celebrating what they're doing. And also it helps you up your game when something comes from a publicist. It's that professional. It's like, you know, as a publicist, I've been working from, from Toronto for years and years before, like for like seven years before I ever actually went to Hollywood. I've been doing all, I met everybody in terms of, you know, everybody comes up here for all the, because we have some big, big music events here. So I'd met everybody from, you know, Dave from the Eurythmics to like, I mean, just like literally everybody comes up here and I got all the selfies with everybody and all the, you know, band, everybody. <clears throat> but first time I went to Hollywood was in 2018. And this is why, same reason you should get a publicist. A publicist going to Hollywood. You know, it's that you real. You made that extra effort. You're not just like you're not just a hobbyist. There's a whole bunch of music hobbyists, and some of them are hugely talented. But music is a business, and the people with money that are going to invest in your little business, which is you as an artist and you as a you know, they they want to see business. They want to see that you're business minded. They like to see that you have support. When you've got a publicist, when you've got that's like having a team. And there's that confidence that, you know, from these big money people too, that they're okay, this is a serious person because they don't know you all that, you know, you send in a month, you know, music that's great music but you know can you ha could you even handle the big time could you because a lot of times the record companies when, when they're about to really put invest in you they'll like invest in like i don't even know what they call it not a, not really a therapist but like kind of a life coach almost you know because they want to make sure that this person that they're going to invest a million dollars in or 10 million dollars in or whatever isn't going to like suddenly pull a kurt cobain next week or before, you know this is a business right so for all these reasons, this is the extra level of professionalism when you have somebody on the, like you said, the office side, the off whatever, that's like, okay, well, my artist, it's that level, extra level of confidence. And also it shows that you invested, you're serious. Again, you're not a hobbyist. You are a professional with the professional acrimons. Here's, you know, and even, it, you know, it just makes a difference because even, even with entrepreneurs and like small business that is, are not entertainment, I've seen some media say, not all the time, you know, but, uh, and very rarely I should say, but see, I have actually seen media say to um, entrepreneurs, oh, that's great, you know, come back, have a publicist send it to me. And probably that's not because they're being snotty, but also because back to that presentation thing, a lot of entrepreneurs are sending them just editorial or advertorial something that's not good so they say they're all like oh they're tired of riffling through 50 things from entrepreneurs or from amateur musicians that aren't too great that aren't professionally presented that aren't that are just a lot of artists too that are brilliant artists but they don't know the game and they'll just email people and be like hey you know listen to my song and if you like my song can you do all this stuff for me and if you believe in me well no there's no publicist that's going to do that there's nobody that's going to do that for 10 percent later there's no because you're asking us to take our already successful reputation our already successful career and essentially out of raw material of just your song build your entire career for you and then after we build your entire career then you're going to give 10 percent 
The best way I can say that is if I'm going to invest all my time for free, you know, that's why you pay the publicist up front, right? Otherwise, if I'm going to invest all my time, all my contacts, all my money, all that stuff into you, and then I build you, then like, then you basically menudo and I'll take 50, I'll take 70%. <laughs> no, you don't want that. You want to pay a publicist a, a fee and I always make it affordable. Like I do with small business, you know, cause I know I, I didn't like my story, my backstory. I didn't come from all this wealth. And so I went to university seeing this as a job where I can make all this money. The money's coming now. The way I do it is I balance. If you come from Hollywood, you know, I don't mean the city. I mean, if you come from a Hollywood project and you got big bucks, then I charge, you know, 3000 bucks a month, three months minimum for, you know, and up. if it's a big, big product end up. But when it comes to small entrepreneurs, when it comes to, you know, a solo artist, an, an author, an individual person, I have two different packages under a thousand dollars a month and where they can, you know, if they were getting longer time, it gets ridiculously low per month, you know, if they're buying up. So I make sure, and that's part of my advocacy, even though my resume has gone through the roof and I have, you know, a better resume than any publicist, I could insist on only taking those high-end clients, but that's not how I started. That's not what got me here. <laughs> you know, what got me here is helping people, somebody who needed a voice, right? So I'm not going to go way so far, way so far away from that but I'm only going to give you a voice if you've got the big bucks already, you know, because then you can just hire any publicist. Anybody will do that for you if you've already got that. Plan. I like to, you know, I can build a lot. I, sh you know, I can build a lot out of a little. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even though nowadays um, you can work for anyone anywhere, um, those who are looking for a publicist close to home, what are some things they need to avoid? Because unfortunately, as we know, in every single industry out there, there are crooks and thieves who take your money and take advantage of you because they know of your ignorance. So what are some things in the PR business specifically if someone comes forth and says you need to avoid them? Yeah, for sure. I also say, and there's a lot of uh, mis like, uh, misunderstanding with people. A lot of people call themselves publicity and they say promo and all that, and they're not actually publicists. What they're doing, you got, that's where you got to really look at it, especially in music and with authors. That's why you'll never see me go and do advertising that because there's no way to not sound like one of these charlatans, you know, and there's been very hard because, yeah, and I hate that so much because, again, especially with musicians and artists. Or, and, and authors, this is their something they've been thinking about. This is their dream. This is their work from their heart that they want to get to the world. And so there are a lot of people who will prey on that. And so watch out for, you know, like there's a, a lot, there's everything from, you know, $50 website, you know, we'll do, give us 50 bucks and we'll blah, 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 to we'll do 2000, blah, blah, blah. But number one thing to look out for, A, it is more than that, but one key thing is, 90% of those sites that say will promote you or whatever, let's see what they're actually doing. And if they're only talking about putting something on their website and tweeting it to their people and all that, they're not, that's not a publicist, that they're not promoting it. They're literally just, you're buying an ad on their space. You know, so if you want to do that, it might be fine. If they have a giant audience, exactly your audience, you know, maybe, but understand that's what you're doing. That's not earned media. That's not promotion in terms of what we do, which is publicity. My job when you hire me from anywhere in the world where it's this English speaking media is, or anybody, or, or what you should ask any post is, is to get you into media, like is to get you interviewed on television. In the, depending on your story, not everybody's going to be interviewed all of a sudden or in the New York Times, you, but you, you can be because a good publicist, will, you know, it, they shouldn't take you on if they don't see your story and see how they could pitch it in different ways in different places. You know what I mean? So our job is to convince reporters, television, newspaper, radio, podcasts, you know, and, and, you know, people that give out awards, you know, submit you to awards, you know, nominations. To, so all that stuff is to like elevate your presence. Awesome. Awesome. So what can a client expect from you? I, I'm, obviously, every client is different, author, singer, actor, dancer, whatever. But for in general, if a client comes to you, what are you going to do for them? So first we talk about what, obviously, first they send me their all, anything existing, their bio, their internet presence, their socials, all that stuff. They can see what's out there already of videos that I do a full deep dive and what, look at it all. Um, and then we talk about what's, what, what are they doing right now? What do they want to be doing? What are their goals? 
what, what, you know, what, what are their hopes? And then really, then we talk to about, so, you know, what they can expect from me, because, which is going to be, before I take them on, I'm going to be telling them, yeah, I already know right now I can get you. You can expect at least this article, this article, I'll write a profile about you in LA, whatever. There's always going to be like right from the beginning, a few things that I know offhand I'll be able to do for them. And then I'm always like, and then we still have the whole month, you know, so we don't know when else we'll be pitching all kinds of stuff, those topical press releases, the things that come up. Also, we'll have an hour long conversation about things you might not be thinking of. So if you came to me and you were like, I want to promote my podcast. So we talk about the podcast and all those things you want to promote and your goals and how you t- I talk about oh maybe we can get you being a public speaker on the things you're an expert on and you know we talk about all that stuff and then also tell me other stuff like do you like deep sea diving <laughs> you know are you uh whatever like do you read tarot cards whatever it is you never know what it is I might see another media opportunity because we haven't even talked about this putting out your media messaging and then there's, you know, having, there's all kinds of, as publicists, there's all kinds of, just like this pod match and matchmaker and those podcast um, matchup services. There's also media matchup services where reporters, New York Times, Oprah, you know, everything, the list, good housekeeping, they're under deadline, they're looking for quick sources. And literally daily, if you go to these or if you sign on to these services, you get these asks. And if you look at them enough, you see it. there's a lot of them for creatives. So if you're a musician that is, you know, in blah, 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 or what kind of, you know, guitar do you like? Or what are you doing during COVID, for, you know, to replace live shows? And so there's all these, the you know, Rolling Stone is in there quite often asking questions. So there's all these opportunities that you could be accessing to get your name out there to build what they call in the corporate world that thought leadership, which just means, you know, when I Google you, there's all kinds of third party things about you being quoted, you're there and you're there. Just like when you Google me now, because I'm a publicist and I do for myself what I do for my clients, right? But not an exact thing. You know, you want that when you find people search your name, they find reviews of your music. They find, you know, you do a contest on, on Instagram or something with a hashtag about your music and you know whatever yeah so that's the way you do it is get visibility and find ways to to get out there and there's more to it too there's all kinds of things you know on the Hollywood end that if you have depending on how much money you have to invest there's you know parties you can literally get into the GQ party hosted by Brad Pitt that's going to have these 10 celebrities at it and if you want to be on that I mean, probably not happening during COVID, but if you want to be on that party boat on the Riviera during, I mean, those are all things where they have VIP parties will make like five places available, literally five invites available to an elite, you know, group of publicists or men. So with that trust that you're not going to be putting some fan kid in there or you're not going to be like it's a professional you know what i mean and when you're in there you're in there you're literally at the party like hey brad i mean like because it's not a thing there's no gate between you and it's just that's it and the point of that is when they're taking all the pictures and gq's taking the pictures and vanity fair's taking the pictures there's tracy right in there in the back with all the celebrities so the perception is as they're building their and that's what record companies do all the time. It's not a fault, and that's literally how they grow celebrities. The, the record companies with money, once they organically sign you on that organic contract because they love you or whatever, and they put all that money in, they literally say, okay, $100,000 goes into marketing. That's what, indie, that's what we as indie promoters are up against, right? That's why it's hard to get on the radio because these guys, the big guys come in with a $100,000 marketing budget, and they just throw everything around, and they're able to buy you know, 15, so that's where it's hard, but that's, there's so many platforms and so many tools now we don't need that anymore. There's all the other ways to elevate yourself. Awesome, awesome. So last question, um, what advice can you give someone who might wanna get into PR, they believe they're interested in, they believe they have the skill, um, what are some, mistakes they can avoid from your own experience i would say don't second guess yourself don't wait just uh, i almost sound like nike just do it but seriously just do it you know what honestly just do it all you need 
is one person to believe in you. You know you're a good writer. You wouldn't be thinking of this. You need to be a good writer. You need to be a good communicator. You need to be quick on your feet. You need to be good with people. You know, all that stuff. If you feel like that's your game, right, just do it. Like, you know what a press release is. It's not that hard. Do what I did. Go to the Google <laughs> and figure it out, you know. And then just, you know, suggest that to, all you need is one entre you know, entrepreneur or one musician, you know. And maybe you should start with, like, if you're starting with music, music, it, it can be a hard game to start with if you don't know it. Because, you know, there's a million artists if you don't know well how to position them. And, you know, that's a, I, I wouldn't suggest you start right off the game with music, you know, with music. But maybe, you know, an entrepreneur that could use a little boost and they're an expert in something, a doctor, lawyer, candlestick maker, a friend or family member, you know, and say, hey, would you pay me? Give me a chance to pitch you to media. Would you pay me? you know, a couple hundred bucks if I did, even if you say, well, what about if you pay me after? I never go at the after, they pay me always up front. But if you're trying to like, whatever it takes to get a couple people to say yes, so you can go out and say, hey, my client, Bob, you know, is an expert in taxidermy and he's going to tell, you know, if you ever need someone to talk, that literally is all it is. You tell, start telling the story to local media and one day you'll get a hit and they'll be like, yeah, I'll talk to that guy. He gets that one thing, and you know, so it's all about pitching that story. And so just, you know, honestly, just do it. Don't be afraid. You do not need a four-year PR degree. You do not need, you just need to be really good. I mean, I built this literally out of nothing, with nothing but a computer and an internet connection and, you know, the background, obviously, by the skills that I had. But when it came down to sitting down and say, I'm going to do this, I was I didn't wait for an investor. I would still be waiting, you know. I didn't wait even for five thousand dollars to get proper computer equipment. I literally had the corner of a rent, you know, at that point we were renting, we'd sold our house, we were renting some crappy apartment, all our stuff was in storage. It was like a literally like basically an empty living room and in my little corner of the empty living room I had an old lap and an old desktop and an internet connection. And this strategic thinking and not and thinking huh okay what can I do with this and you know what we all have that power now because we have as long as you have that internet connection or because we're all at home now we're all that same disadvantage slash advantage and the whole world is just looking at the screen so you know your idea is as good as the next person's reach out marketing even in terms of just connecting with people and networking everybody's hungry for that right now like you know what I mean? Just don't be afraid to get out there. And that's the way to be build success, even in this crazy environment that we currently find ourselves in. Even when there's no palm trees in my life. That is all the time we have for you today on the show must go on. I want to thank our guest, Tracy Lara Murray, for taking the time to share her journey and her insight with us and you, the audience. Thank you for viewing. Have a great day. Have a great week.